you so much for joining us. My name is Justine Barda, and I'm the founder and CEO of Telescope Film, a website for international film and TV. We offer a database of over half a million international films and series with links to where to watch them in the U.S. We also have a dedicated page on the site for French film and TV with information about what's new and what's popular from France, as well as curated selections. We are delighted to be collaborating with uh, AFUSA, the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French. Here's a quick video about them. We'll put links to more information about both AFUSA and Telescope Film in the chat in just a moment. So the French Cinematheque takes place the fourth Monday of every month. Next month, month we'll be talking about the film, uh, The Animal Kingdom, directed by Thomas Caillé, about a mutation that slowly transforms humans into animals. Uh, but today, before we get started, a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, please keep yourselves muted when you're not speaking and stay on speaker view. To ask a question, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature at the bottom of your screen. It's in the reaction section, or you can also put your question in the chat. If there are technical issues, you may want to leave the Zoom, then sign back in after a couple minutes using the original Zoom link. This event is being recorded for our YouTube channels, and the total runtime is one hour. And with that, I would like to introduce Peter de Bruges, chief film critic for Variety and the facilitator of the French Cinematheque. So Peter, I'll hand things over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, I see a few familiar faces and some new ones. Welcome. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to do this. I'm a chief film critic of Variety, which uh, allows me the privilege to uh, to see a lot of these films early and to sort of weigh in, share my opinion then. What I love about this series is it's a conversation where I get to hear moviegoers' opinions, and uh, we get to have a dialogue. So my role is to sort of facilitate that conversation, but I don't want to monopolize it. I really want to hear from all of you, or as many of you as feel uh, unshy enough to speak up. But uh, this uh, this week's, or this month's uh, entry uh, is part of an expansion beyond France to French language cinema elsewhere. It's a Belgian film, a first film by uh, a woman named Laura Wandel, who won uh, Cannes' best short film prize uh, with, uh, uh, let me double check the, it was Les Corps Etrangères, um, uh, Strange Body, or Strange Body Bodies. Um, I just clicked away from it, uh, plural. I have not had a chance to see the short film, but a few important people did like the Dardenne brothers, who are probably the most famous filmmakers in Belgium working today. They've won uh, two Palme d'Or prizes. Uh, they made a film called Rosetta that sort of put them on the map early on. Uh, that was uh, sort of a portrait of a young girl. And there's a lot, uh, a working class or even kind of lower class um, uh, girl. All of their films are kind of made around their their hometown in um in Belgium. But uh, what's interesting here is they saw the potential um, in uh, Laura's work and uh, and sort of supported, mentored, and encouraged her without turning her movie into a Dardenne film. Although if you know their work, you may see certain similarities. You might see those similarities anyway. If you're a Belgian filmmaker working in a country where two guys have won two of the biggest prizes in the movie kingdom, uh, you're probably aware of their influence and their aesthetic. Um, but uh, the um, uh, this is a film that took Laura seven years to um, to write and and sort of uh, nail down. It went through a lot of 
kind of evolution. I had a chance uh, two years ago when the film was submitted by Belgium to speak with Laura. And I might, if it sort of works into our conversation, share a, a couple of sound bites. It was a conversation where uh, she was answering in French and I was clumsily doing my best to keep up. So, uh, you know, we'll, um, we'll maybe play a couple of sound bites that are relevant there. And I can bring in some insights that I know from that conversation about the production to our conversation here. But um, uh, what I want to do is just start with kind of like the gut reactions that we have to a movie like this, because I found it to be one of the most powerful films I saw that year. Um, and uh, it's something that speaks to such a universal experience. We all were children once, we all went to school, we all witnessed or participated in bullying. And uh, the um, and many of us are parents who may have seen or be in the process of watching our children kind of go through this. So there's kind of like different pain angles, different, you know, entry points to this. Um, the uh, uh, I think I just want to like throw it open to kind of hear what a few people thought just feeling wise. And we'll kind of build and, and trace the conversation from there. I realize that kind of... Um, uh, puts it broadly, but to me, this is such an emotional gut punch of a movie, especially if you get to the end and you just kind of see where this journey takes the characters. Um, who had kind of a really strong reaction that they want to share and we can kind of bounce off of one another? Here we'll kind of raise our hands or unmute ourselves. Um, the uh, uh, Does anyone want, want to go first? Francis, I approve of your green walls. <laughs> Welcome you. to the conversation and uh, uh, tell me your thoughts. Well, I found it very difficult to watch. Um, Do you mean in a, in a positive way or in a... Uh... No, just it just hit me in my solar plexus, the whole thing. And I think a lot of that had to do with the camera never leaving Nora. It was just seen through her eyes throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that is attributable to the her mentors, whether that's just Laura's thing, but um, it was extraordinary. I mean, I had, I just, I was, I experienced all kinds of feelings during the film, um, rooting for Nora, getting angry with Nora, you know, just all of it, all, just every, every opportunity to feel emotion was in that picture and yeah. I was also really struck by the fact that and remembering how kids function during the day like they're in a classroom presumably learning something like how to write or whatever and then all this other stuff is happening in the periphery or in the moment or right before or right after and and the fact that they can even do that is astounding to me so yeah there's a scene in particular right where she's seen her brother thrown into the dumpster and she has made this choice as instructed not to say anything and she goes back to class and we know what she knows and we know what she's choosing not to do and everything that's going on in class you know the the classmate whispering the right answer as if the right answer matters in the slightest to her or us in this moment you know and uh, and, you know, the way that our we kind of implode a little bit when the adult comes in and says something has happened to your brother because it could be anything at that point. Right. You know, the uh, uh, OK, well, uh, kind of build on this, Maureen, I see your hand up. I see uh, some others, too. So we'll kind of make sure we get to everybody. Go ahead, Maureen. Oh, I think uh, Sharif was before me. I'll OK, then we'll we'll you. go in that order. Go ahead, Sharif. Well, uh, uh, I think the French title of the movie is more appropriate because it's a month. Right. And when the the uh, I saw that, of course, uh, on the streaming uh, platform here, they 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 had the French title in small letters while the English title playground and 
capital letters. I think this, this is the thing that struck me. This is Nora or a girl or right. a child who is introduced to the world. She is totally innocent. She comes clean, naive, pure, and then gradually she absorbs how to survive in this world and see how the world is not ideal and how the world is functioning around her. This is, yeah. I think, what the the theme that uh, that uh, attracted me to the movie. Yeah, so I'm just going to make sure that everybody picks up on what you're saying. The French title is A Monde, A World, which has a very different connotation from Playground. In fact, it's in some ways the opposite connotation. If Playground kind of focalizes it on a very specific one place, a mold suggests that this is uh, a bigger story, bigger, uh, bigger themes. Uh, and um, you have set up a question that I had for her. I don't love the French title. I like that it got you thinking in that way, but in some ways I think it's actually um, too expansive. And so I asked Laura about it. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play her um, answer, and then I'm going to do my best to translate it. And I might do this in bits so that, you know, kind of like we can break it up. But here is um, uh, me asking Laura about the title. Hang on a second. I think I'm going to see if I can slow her voice down just a smidge. She started by saying, uh, you know, at the beginning, that didn't wasn't actually our title. It was called Les Naissances des Arbes. I think I uh, asked her to repeat it because it's hard to understand. So uh, I'll let it play for a second. La naissance des arbres. Oui, okay. Voilà. Et c'est au montage, j'ai senti que le film ne correspondait plus à ce titre. All right, so she's saying... Uh, Originally, the title was The Birth of Trees, and it's in the editing that I felt like the film no longer matched that title. So I've always tried as a director to be open to what the film needs. It was more uh, the, the film that I uh, had imagined. Uh, it was not no longer the film that I had okay. imagined, but so much the better because that's what's beautiful. It's a living thing. So, so I started looking for another title, and this might seem strange, but it came to me in a dream. I saw it written in a dream, and I felt like that was it. Um, what, uh, you know, what's interesting, this uh, title, Les Naissances des Arbes, if the movie was going to be more or less the same thing, you know, the... Um, uh, what she's uh, sort of hinting at with that original title, I guess, is what happens on the playground, what happens in our youth is, you know, kind of what forms us as adults, you know, but uh, I think Sharif, to your point, she was starting to sense that um, uh, there was something bigger, maybe that she wanted to say. Uh, uh, she mentioned that at first her producers were kind of reluctant to go with this title. It was maybe a little too... Uh, unclear, generic, something like this. Um, and uh, and she looked to see maybe there were other movies that had this title. Would that be a problem? But found that there uh, there weren't and that she wanted to go forward with it. I asked her kind of as a follow-up question because I think what Amond suggests is that there's some sort of 
allegory or metaphor that she's probably trying to get across. So here's what she said. Dear. Oui, oui, oui. Ça m'a, de toute façon, j'essaye quand même, quand je, quand je, j'écris une histoire, de toujours faire une allégorie du monde. Enfin, il me semble que c'est, c'est, c'est hyper important. Enfin, en tant qu'artiste, il faut toujours, hein, il me semble, hein, ça c'est mon point de vue. So, yes, I, I try when I write a story to always make an allegory of the world. It seems super important. At least that's my point of view. As an artist, it seems to me that you must always reflect something bigger. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Dans la cour de récréation, il prend toute la place. So here she's pointing out an example. Obviously, my story doesn't only talk about this, but it's like territorial issues. The fact that the football field takes up all the space on the playground. Et euh, et en fait, évidemment, je me suis je me suis pas mal renseigné. Chez moi, j'ai un livre photo qui reprend toutes les cours de récréation du monde, et c'est C'est très souvent le terrain de foot qui prend toute la place. C'est toutes les récréations du monde, on dirait qu'elles sont, elles sont faites de la même manière. So, she did a lot of research on her own, and at, at home she has a photo book with playgrounds from all over the world. And it's very often that the football field takes up all the room. That's true the way that these spaces are made all over the world. Le terrain de foot qui prend toute la place, Mais donc, ça veut dire que les enfants qui n'ont pas envie de jouer au foot, eh bien, ils ont des petits espaces sur les côtés, presque rien. Et enfin, voilà, c'est, c'est quand même, je trouve que ça montre quand même quelque chose d'énorme de notre monde, en fait. So, uh, you always have these huge football fields, which means the children who don't want to play football, they have these tiny spaces on the sides, hardly anything. And I think that shows a lot about uh, something huge about our world, she says. So what I like about her answer, which is not the thing I picked up on at all, you know, I think we're so concentrated on Nora, we're not even really aware of the football um, or soccer games kind of going on around her. But um, the, uh, uh, the idea that she intends for us to sort of pick up on different things of our own, whatever we see or, or read into this and extrapolate it. So the title is an invitation to extrapolate, to read deeper into the microcosm we see here. We'll get, we'll follow up some more on on this idea because I think that is really what the concentration, the conversation we have can focus on is what you read into it. But um, that that French language title, a world, really does encourage that. Um, Maureen, thank you for your patience. I'm coming to you now. It gave me a few more minutes to think about, like, categorize, like, the three things I wanted to say and may try to make sense out of it. First thing, I thought I was very impressed by Nora's acting. For such a child, she, you forget she was acting. Uh, you know, I, I can only guess how old she was, but her performance was incredibly moving um, and, and, and very real. Um, so, uh, that was the first thing that I, in, in, that I found myself getting drawn to. The second thing was when I saw the whole, as, as the film evolved and progressed, um, it kind of reminds, as you said, it's universal. It reminds me of the, the power, the human desire to be accepted at any cost, even mm. if it means you know, being, uh, not really being yourself, but to conform to what other people want you to be. Um, And she saw at the beginning, Nora was very much alone. Uh, She wanted to sit with her brother. She had a hard time making friends. And then she she started to change because she allowed herself to do what the other girls wanted her to do. even though she had to play along with it. Um, and what she needed to do was to be a part of it. She didn't want to be rejected uh, from a group like her brother was. Um, and then the other thing that struck me is when she used to hold her breath underwater, 
Um, and to the point where <clears throat> she, you were, I was afraid she'd almost pass out. Um, and the way I saw it is that she was so frustrated. It was almost like a self-inflicted punishment, a sort of frustration. It's like people get so frustrated, they wanna hurt themselves because they don't see an outlet. Um, and so the whole scene where she would throw herself in the water and hold her breath to the point where her teacher, you know, pulled her out and said, catch your breath. Um, and that that's what I, th I that's the way I interpreted it. Uh, she it's part of her frustration and and sort of, like I said, punish herself for not being able to help her brother. You know, it's interesting. There's uh, swimming pools kind of serve. Uh, they've almost become a trope in movies where it is a place underwater that you can kind of escape the world. If you think of the the graduate, you know, the kind of uh, that's probably the earliest example I can think of. of you know, um, uh, Dustin Hoffman, all the adults around the pool are talking to him. That's where the plastics conversation comes in and everything, you know, like um uh, they're trying to tell him what to do with his life and he jumps into the water and the camera goes into the water with you and suddenly all of that noise and all of that stress is blocked out for the period that you're under there. And so it's like, it's kind of a, a return to the womb. It's kind of a silencing, a, you know, a place. But you point out this kind of variation on it that happens here where there's something almost dangerous about it. And um, I don't, know if I picked up as closely as you did on your point. I think it's a good reading, but it's mirrored if you think about what happens with the blindfold, right? Where in that moment, she's doing something kind of similar. She's uh, playing a game with the girls that she's now made, a f made friends with on the um, playground. And she lifts the blindfold and sees the, I think it's the bin scene. Like she sees in the distance, um, uh, what's going on and she lowers the blindfold again so like going underwater and in the course of wandering around she bumps into people knocks over and she, that's when she scrapes her knee you know so it's like she causes herself harm in the in the act of kind of like uh she is learning to shut out this thing which you, we almost have to do partly to get by on life but as everyone is telling her, and as we know, you also have to assume a certain involvement, a certain responsibility. And so this is this kind of impossible quandary she's faced with too young to kind of know what to do, right? Um, but uh, the um, we keep going back to those swimming lessons. And I think you picked up probably on the key when it kind of becomes dangerous to her. Um, Pascal, I saw your hand up uh, and then uh, we'll go to Mira afterwards. Yes, hi. Uh, and I'm sorry, first, I cannot... Uh turn on the video today. Um, what I, I wanted to say uh, back to the title mm -hmm. is actually, I love that title. Um, Amonde, it's, it's all, also if it, if it would have been my more monde, because it's my world. Um, it's to me, Amonde is happened to be the, mon the world of that little girl. And we see, um, like it was said before, everything through her eyes because we are in her world, in a world of a little girl. And, mm -hmm. and, and we totally feel what she feels because we are her. And what was really uh, amazing to me in the cinematography is how this supports that idea by putting all those people that are not in her world blurry. I, so only the people that counts that are really in, I'm sorry to say, in her, in her world again, mm -hmm. that um, those are the people that are, that we can see um, um, completely and all the others are, outside that world and and yeah, therefore sure. uh Rory, that's what it's I interesting want. it's a little bit like if you know the peanuts uh you know uh specials or whatever when you know uh 
adults have their voices garbled and they're always kind of cut off at the knees. We have the, uh, it's a very unusual choice uh, to film at kind of like eye level to a child. And yet it's a hugely effective one. I think we probably all agree that that's, you know, kind of like one of the core concepts of this film is that we are at her level. We are looking at her more than seeing what she sees. Sometimes we'll kind of, you know, that's a difference between what Laura Wandel is doing and what those mentors of her, the Darden brothers, who are genius filmmakers, but their style comes out of documentary and it often kind of follows characters. So it's almost, if you ever see this style in a movie, uh, it is likely something that's coming from the Darden brothers where you're kind of walking along behind a character and staring at the back of their head. And you want nothing more than to see their face because their face is kind of like where all the meaning is. But the that choice is kind of like putting us almost in as close to kind of inside their head as you can be. And uh, even though their heads block part of the view, but a lot of other filmmakers like Darren Aronofsky, when he made The Wrestler or when he made Black Swan, kind of adopted that Darden brother style of just being in the back of their head. And there's a little bit of that here. I mean, there's a little bit of that just that occurs naturally. Not everyone's quoting the Darden brothers, but that was really a style they committed to of, you know, observing verite like. Here it's much more. Uh, constructed, I think, and we're looking at the face of the girl. And I think that uh, when I asked Laura about this, she said that that uh, face is where everything plays out. So it goes to, you know, that is the screen, that is the canvas uh, and uh, that she wanted us to look at. And um, the uh, it puts a lot on the child's performance, but I think it also um, is us painting on that canvas, our memories, our anxieties, you know, it's like the, the, the actress is incredible, you know, how upset she is in the early scenes when she's crying later on, which she seems to be uh, holding in. But sometimes if you kind of, you know, play it with a poker face, then this is kind of a, a, a trick of cinema. We write onto that what we, what we see. And that's, I think, one of the things that's so effective about this. Um, I think maybe to extrapolate a, a point that uh, you were just making, um, the only time we see adults is when she really engages with them. The teacher, her father, you know, the, the kind of less helpful teacher who kind of is slow to go to the um, bathroom where her brother is being, you know, taunted. Um, but, uh, and when the teacher engages with her, you know, it's really meaningful, I think, you know, but she has to kind of kneel down to be at um, Nora's level for that scene. Um, Mira, uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Hey, hi. Um, yeah, everybody made a bunch of great points that I uh, agree with uh, pretty much. Um, just a, a couple of things I, I hope I'm adding. I stepped away for a moment, so sorry if I'm repeating anything. Number one, um, I think, you know, with the breath holding I felt like that's what I was doing this whole, the whole film. Mm -hmm. um, but also part of it is because it's like, you want her to, to escape or, or to avoid the, the horrors that her brother is, is living. And you, you watch her as she realizes there are not necessarily any safe spaces. Like it all, they turn on her as well. You know, kids can be cruel. Kids are, you know, people can be cruel and she's, she's learning it, I guess, better early than late. Um, so that was one thing, which is like, oh, she, oh you know, she, oh, she's, you know, she's, she gets, she doesn't escape that. Um, and then the other thing is the, 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 the camera and the, and the, I don't want to say point of view, but the viewpoint for the viewer, it's mm -hmm. kind of like you're, um, Yes, you're at her level. It is not her point of view, but you see how confined and restricted her her point of view is because you can't see, you know, you can't see up, you can't see it, you know, an adult level. Um, you see how she is very restricted, not just in what she can and can't do because of her age, but also her size. 
Um, and then the last thing is a, a, a quick question. Um, and this is a small thing, but I guess it just struck me, you know, the very helpful young teacher and like two thirds or three quarters of the way through she leaves the school. Like, was she being scapegoated? I'm wondering. It's just a question. Nobody has to answer that. But um, do you think she, you know, because she had to leave. She had to, she said she, at least that's what I understood. She had to, um, she was leaving the school, like in the middle of the year or whatever. I don't, I don't remember. And it doesn't feel like that much woman. time has passed. I mean, certainly time is passing because we see, uh, but, um, and there needs to be because there's progress obviously, um, between certain scenes, but, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Did yeah, anyone I was just kind of um, wondered if anybody had any thoughts on that too. So those are my few things. Because she is such like, she's the, the, she's everything you want in an adult in this movie, you know? So like when, uh, and, uh, and it's, and it's interesting, the dynamic, you know, when she engages with the boys and their teacher comes down the staircase and you realize, oh man, even the adults have these, you know, yeah. these weird turf things and these dynamics between them. And I think that again goes to the title, right? Like um, what we're seeing here is a microcosm of the world we live in and bullying occurs here in its kind of infancy, but like it occurs around us all the time. And what do we do when we're presented with those things, you know? Um, the uh, uh, did um, did anyone pick up on kind of what becomes of the teacher? I don't know if um, uh, that kind of escaped me. I don't know if I even really kind of clocked um, uh, that as much. Uh, but uh, the um, Mira, Mira, I had the exact same thought uh, that she suffered became... some. I I had a I have a theory, but I don't know if it's true. Um, you know the the uh, the uh, teachers, you know, because because the education is national, it's a national uh, system, teachers are sent from one city to another. And sometimes, um, I guess in the middle of the, um, maybe she was sobbing or something like that. So she was sent somewhere else. Um, that's my theory, because I know that, you know, some teachers, um, uh, uh, teach for you know so many so much time in a, in a city and then they're sent somewhere else that makes a lot of sense uh yeah. especially yeah. since the scapegoating theory i don't think the adults are aware of what we are seeing and what nora is seeing in a lot of this case you know and the ones who are i don't think nora's teacher would have any responsibility in in those things but it is uh but it is a reminder too of like um it's true of teachers in the system you described it's true of priests in certain parishes you know it's like you may find uh someone you really connect with and then when that's taken away uh you have to rebuild or start over um the uh maria uh go ahead i see your hand up did note the teacher leaving and I thought it was a terribly sad moment because there's no mother figure in this movie. She's alone with a father who apparently doesn't work. And she really became attached. I think her name was, was it Agnes, Madame Agnes. And uh, she cries and cries. She just, when she's saying goodbye to her, she's leaning into her shoulder. And it's, it's a very traumatic thing for her to go through. I think to lose that teacher who's she's gained trust in and it's a it, it's a very devastating part of the film I think the mm -hmm. other part that I thought was very traumatic was the birthday invitation scene which I think is uh something that a lot of people can relate to that feeling of not being invited or worse for her was that she was invited and suddenly because of the other friend who doesn't who says she's not going to come and if you know Nora goes uh, and because there's all this, you know, with the brother and all this fighting and and uh, now suddenly Nora suffers because she is desperate. She really wants to go to that birthday party. That's something normal. We don't know what she does outside of school. We have no idea. She goes home with her father and we don't know. 
that this is something that would bring her into a world, a different world, another amont, uh, that she would have a birthday party and maybe celebrations and, and presents and things. And she is devastated. And when she tears up those invitations, I, I totally felt <laughs> her, her anger at this. I thought it was very, very moving moment of the movie. So. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's a key moment in what you could call a subplot here. Like in the first scene, she arrives at school, knows only one person, that's her brother, you know, and it's kind of not appropriate for her to cling to him as we learn, you know, it's kind of like he wants his own life and maybe whatever she's doing is actually making his situation more difficult. Uh, and uh, the teachers in the cafeteria, you know, she's trying to sneak away and they insist that she turn around and say, say, you'll make friends. And we know that's true, but we also probably remember whether it's ourselves or our kids, you know, like uh, how hard it is to convince someone who's shy, who's in a new group, you know, kind of like that, that will happen. And so you get this kind of montage a little bit later of things that seem to be going well for Nora. You know, uh, her brother's having a hard time, but, uh, you know, she's kind of like doing well on the balance beam and she's um, uh, making friends with these girls on the playground and they're doing things. And there's this scene where they're sitting at the cafeteria making animal shapes with their uh, sandwiches or something like that. Right. So that progress has been going in the right direction. And then the stuff that happens with her brother, specifically the thing with him peeing his pants, you know, where he's, I think we can assume that that is not uh, his fault, but rather somehow he's been provoked or, you know, made to do that by these kids who are like harassing him. But that seems to be a, a moment of like stigma that rubs off on her and jeopardizes then these friendships. So she's been making progress. And then I think, as heartbreaking as the scene you mentioned is like seeing that Nora, who's such a, a pure soul saying these horrible things to her brother then about like, I wish you were dead. And, you know, kind of like that seems to be a direct consequence of the, the way that his social shame is kind of rubbing off on her. And all of this, I think is going back to that. It's happening in specific to these characters, but their dynamics that, can happen to us in the real world. Um, did any of you guys see um, the Inside Out sequel that just came out? I mean, this is just a random throwing it to something. Else. I love this movie. So uh, since nobody is raising their hand, I won't. Uh, but there's a great moment in that film where the the girls, uh, uh, the, the main character who's a girl has a reaction kind of like overcoming that kind of stigma. And it's like, you almost never see that happen in a, um, in young people where they they kind of uh, risk shame on themselves to kind of help someone else who's in a tricky position, but it's kind of a, a really moving thing. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. I did see Inside Out, thanks to my grandsons. And there were a lot of things I don't know, they six years old and four year old, but I definitely got it because you could almost kind of relate to something like that. Um, as you were saying, sometimes I mean, it's those universe. movies put us okay. in kids' heads as well. You know, it's, oh, yeah. uh, this one. But um, the other thing I was going to mention when you were saying about how Nora wanted to separate herself from her brother because it became like a stigma to be associated with him was the scene when the photographer, remember, to sit together, brother and sister, the you know, sibling picture. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, this is getting sadder and sadder because mm -hmm. you could see how the gap was getting wider and wider. Um, and I thought that was that was really extremely sad to watch. Incredibly, yeah. incredibly heart-wrenching. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna mention, because it uh, Justine added it to the comment section, but it's worth saying, we've been talking about the Darden brothers who are, who are their own filmmakers, but really among, if if I, you know, had to count on one hand, the most important filmmakers in the world, two of those fingers would go to the Darden brothers. So, uh, you know, you can check out some of their other work. Uh, I think their best film is the one that won them their second Palme d'Or called L'Enfant, The Child. Um, it might be a interesting kind of where to go from here uh, thing. Uh, I see... Uh, Zainab raising her hand. Go ahead. 
think that what you said, we we come this, I think, I don't know how to put it. The world, a monde, is a place where we all live. Mm -hmm. We see different aspects depending from different pers perspectives. And it depends on your experience in life. But the themes that are dealt with, whether your experience enables you to take it lightly or whether you take it to heart, mm -hmm. we don't know. For example, there is abuse, social pressure, racism, and, and of course, what, what life tells us all the time that the abused become very bad abusers. And this is an example of uh, of Nora's brother. He, mm -hmm. he he sided with those who were abusing him. And for example, in the classroom, when uh, when the well, you assume they are immigrant children. They say their names. They are all Arabic names, mm -hmm. but you never see them. You just hear them. They are Except for this one kind of who's part of the bully trio who becomes uh, the bully. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's mine. He is the one chosen by the abusers to be abused. Probably mm -hmm. if the film kept going, Ismail himself would become an abuser. So that's that's what I mean. Uh, we see already Nora as a child. We see what she sees and what she sees is socially determined. She she sees the world in the way that her socioeconomic strata of society taught her to see it, True. And, and and so I think the film, the 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 title Amond is a very 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 good one, because we all participate in it, we are all part of it, and we have different perspectives and different angles from which we see it. There is no one meaning. That's it's true, true. And, and you're and right. Yeah. Uh, the um, uh, I I think that uh, one thing that you can often find in European and French and Belgian cinema that is harder to untangle in American movies is class. Uh, in in America, we like to pretend as if there is no such thing as class, when that is, of course, not the case. But I think in Europe. It's a much more codified thing. And uh, and it's interesting that you sense a kind of hierarchy here, you know, in terms of certain children come from working parents. Nora does not. Nora's maybe a social welfare case. Her father is not working, kind of perceived as... And that's not something that the kids are even remotely understanding of what the kids are doing is taking whatever they've heard at home or on the news or something like that and they're internalizing it and applying it in a judgmental way and of course what's happening with Malik but also with those other immigrant uh, students is related to this as well there are class issues and the kind of immigration tension which exists very much in America but different from uh, in Europe, you know, here uh, we do not have kind of refugee immigration in quite the same way that you do in Europe. And so there's, you know, kind of and and uh, I think there's also a much more of a tendency towards assimilation in America between immigrants and, uh, you know, the kind of American melting pot in general in Europe. You have different religions, different languages who may not become Catholic, may not give up, you know, their um, backgrounds in countries that are religious. So you have all these kind of tensions that are part of a, a monde, the world in which we live, that are playing out on this playground, that are playing out in these classrooms. You know, it's like, remember the scene where uh, they define racism? You know, it's like uh, they're at the um, uh, they're at the cafeteria table and uh, I forget exactly how they put it, but it's something along the lines of like um, a racist is someone who's only interested in themselves or something like that. And you realize like they've heard the word. It's maybe been discussed with a parent. You know, it's present already 
at their young age. And yet their understanding of it is in some ways poetic and also incomplete, you know, um, but uh, the there's a, there's a lot going on and to unpack in such a slender movie, you know, um, I'm monologuing a little bit too much. Who else would like to um, chip in? I can also throw it to Laura. I have another soundbite. I, I have only prepared these three. So the third soundbite of hers um, uh, was, I was curious because it feels so lived in how much of this was her childhood, you know, and how much of it was fiction. So I asked her that question and let me, oops, I have not yet queued up um, the, let's find it. Here we go. All right. Non, je dirais que c'est un mélange de plusieurs choses. Il y a des choses qui sont qui viennent de souvenirs personnels. Il y a beaucoup de choses aussi que j'ai lues parce que je me suis énormément renseignée et j'ai lu beaucoup de choses d'un un pédopsychiatre qui a écrit sur les violences à l'école qui s'appelle Bruno Imbeg. All right, so she's saying it's actually quite a big mix of things. There are some of my own memories in here, but there are lots of things that I read as well, including uh, work by a child psychologist who specializes in violence among young people called Bruno Umbeck. He's a Belgian um, academic. Des choses qu'on m'a raconté. Donc, je dirais vraiment que... C'est un énorme mélange de plein de choses. Et c'était très important, ça aussi, pour moi, de ne pas être que dans mes propres souvenirs. Parce que mon but, c'est pas de... Dans un certain sens, c'est pas de faire ma, ma thérapie, en fait. Oui. So, it's... Uh, there are things people told me. It's a big mix of things. And it was really important for me not to be only in my own memories. The goal wasn't for me to do my own therapy with this film. C'est vraiment d'essayer... Mais que ce soit le plus universel possible, et j'avais l'impression que c'est de cette manière-là, en ouvrant mon champ le plus largement possible, c'est peut-être comme ça que j'avais touché aussi le plus de monde. Oui. So, it, my goal was really to make it as universal as possible. Again, a monde, right? By opening my field as large as possible, it's how I would reach the largest number of people. So, I think we sense that it's informed by things she did, but also she spent a lot of time, uh, you know, kind of researching, speaking, observing. Um, uh, I think that's probably what we would expect. I pushed her a little bit farther and asked her, you know, what is uh, sort of a, an example? And she pointed to tying her shoes. So that's a, you know, a scene that we see a couple of times in the movie, right? And the point she wanted to make there is she can remember learning to tie her shoes and how, as a young person, uh, it was the biggest victory you could imagine learning to do that. And how that kind of, that scales uh, kind of changes uh, and puts in perspective what's going on here. It goes back to something, maybe Francis, you were saying of like, um, the uh, uh, when you're in a classroom and you're, you know, not necessarily think what a child is going through. It's like, you know, the uh, the things that they're focusing on and the importance of things. And I think maybe that thing that I just said, the importance of things is what we're seeing here. This movie is illustrating the process of socialization, you know, how we learn, not just cursive, not just how to count the number of stars on a paper, but how we learn how to talk to other people, how to intervene on behalf of someone who needs our help, how to not get beaten up, how to make and maintain friends. All of these things, it's like we learn them at such a young age, we are all imprinted by those experiences, but uh, it's probably long gone except for maybe a few traumatic cases in our childhood, you know, it's long gone how we learned those things. And in a way, this movie is taking us back to that place and reminding us kind of like, you know, where did we, where did we learn to speak up and intervene on other people's behalf? Or when did we stop doing that? You know? Um, and uh, I don't know about you, but one of the things that really hurt me to watch this in a personal way 
was uh, realizing, you know, my narrative of my childhood is often focused on the times I was bullied or the times, I don't mean like I carry that in a, but I mean, like, I remember those, uh, those stories and I tend to erase or downplay cases in which I did that to other people. And those also existed. I think that's very common that, you know, we, um, uh, we can find ourselves on both ends of that equation. And this movie, I thought, you know, kind of portrayed that in a way that uh, we've been describing, right? Like in a way that sometimes it's as simple as uh, if you were bullied, you pass that on. But I think it's also, you know, kind of like the the power dynamic between you and other individuals, you know, uh, the way you are treated by your classmates is different from the way that you uh, treat your younger sibling or something like that, you know, and again, all of these things play into these universal aspects of being a human being, right? Uh, okay, me monologuing again. Uh, I, may I just say one <laughs> one quick thing? Um, what, what you, um, I didn't raise my hand. Uh, what you were saying, made me. I was thinking more of the brother whose name now I can't, escapes me, but like that kid it has basically shown um, he represents or port, sort of demonstrates survival. Like, even yeah. though it sounds like it's cruel that he's like telling his sister, don't, don't help me. You're going to make it worse. You know, like he knows, like, so that's one thing. And then them becoming the aggressor, that's another, like it's self-preservation. And he's kind of like, as I think many people have alluded, this is, you know, could potentially be any kid, you know, a, a few steps down after being, harassed and bullied and and that kind of thing but if you look at it from his point of view which is this is what i got to do to survive it's not a question of good or bad and and she can't comprehend that at least not initially but um yeah yeah and i, I, mean, I thought he was remarkable as well but he is yeah. the character's name is abel i'm not sure what the uh, actor, abel abel yeah. yes it was yeah. abel yeah but um the uh i but and there are there are any number of kind of uh, clues that we can read or project or whatever onto um, you know it's interesting that uh, the actress who plays Nora I I see like an adult face there I mean she's obviously young but there's like there's a kind of wisdom a kind of you know in the features it's really interesting but um, uh, for Abel uh, it's different there's there's a certain femininity, the long hair, the kind of features. It's like that can be a trigger for the way that kids are treated on the playground that may have nothing to do with it. I mean, uh, the thing that's so cruel about bullying is um, a child should never be blamed for receiving that kind of treatment, but children are can be incredibly cruel. And the teachers seem to recognize it as part of being their age, right? You know, like when they say boys get into fights at that age or something like that, you know? Um, uh, all right, we're, we're kind of winding down. Any kind of closing thoughts here? I wanted to say something quickly. Yeah, uh, sure. If I may. Um, you know, what surprises me, they seem to, I mean, I would imagine there were a lot of kids in the playground why was there only one monitor in the whole playground? I mean, you know, it's like, where are the other teams? I mean, you know, the, the the scene with being thrown in the dumpster, that took a while, unless it was here. Yeah, right. It plays and out then, for a while. Like, yeah. It went on for a long time. Um, and I'm thinking, there's only one person, mo one teacher monitoring what's going on. I thought that was kind of odd. I, I wonder if that is true or if it's just that we only see one. You know, it's like right. we we definitely, I think they establish a plausible way to read that in the way that when she solicits the help of the teacher who's helping a crying child, you know, in that moment, we understand that the teachers, whether it's one or a few, are overwhelmed, distracted, and oblivious, let's be honest. I mean, like they're not seeing what Nora is seeing um, and not seeing what the kids are experiencing. Um, and I mean, if I had a child Nora's age, a movie like this would make me incredibly anxious just thinking like, what am I sending 
my child out into. And yet, you know, kids have to, they can't be in the little, you know, nest the whole time. They're going to have to learn. And this world becomes kind of like uh, the, the safe zone in which they pick up these lessons that they're going to have to take into their adult lives, you know, um, as well. So it's harsh. It's interesting. Like we get bullying as a theme a lot in American movies, but it's not so common in European ones. And when I see it in European ones, it is so much worse. I mean, it is like uh, the, so it's not as kind of common. Like, I think you'll never see a high school set movie where there's not some dynamic of bullying going on in an American film, right? But in in these European ones, I mean, the the finale of this film is life and death, right? He's like got a plastic bag over Malik's head. It's, I mean, it's harrowing, right? Um, but, uh, and, um, but they don't seem to have the same national conversation about bullying either, which must be part of Laura's, uh, Wandel's reason for telling the story, just to sort of um, draw attention to that as well. Um, as we round up here, I guess we can kind of tease next month's movie. Um, we have chosen a film, uh, La Reine Animal, uh, Animal Kingdom, with kind of Halloween in mind, you know, the um, uh, the discussion will happen late in October. And this is a sort of fantastical movie uh, in which uh, something is turning people into animals. And uh, it, uh, it throws us into that situation and we're kind of observing it happening around. This is another film to come out of the, the Cannes Film Festival. It, um, it opened... A certain regard, I believe, that's kind of the um, parallel section to the main competition, which is the same section where Playground won the Fipreski or International Critics Prize in its year. Um, so these are uh, uh, these are acclaimed films. This one's you know a very different kind of supernatural, and it's impressive. What I can tease is it's impressive to kind of see. Uh, we take for granted superhero movies and special effects things and this and that coming out of Hollywood. This is kind of exciting to see what a French director with very different resources and very different imagination does with kind of um, playing with fantastical elements. So um, uh, the, uh, and I see someone mentioning here in the chat uh, that they haven't seen uh, the movie yet. You're, you can always find any of these films we're talking about on telescope.com. Uh, that'll point you kind of like to where to find them streaming. And maybe you're checking out this uh, conversation online later, not one of the people in our room. Uh, I hope we piqued your interest and you'll want to check out the movie. We've probably spoiled all the best parts, but um, maybe we've given you something to think about. Uh, all right. I'm going to kick it over for final words to Justine, I guess, but thank you all for joining and thank you for sharing your thoughts. I, I really love hearing from you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and thanks also to Renee Ketchum, Melissa Sora and Isabel the Rue with the Alliance Francaise. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, for joining us today and for such a thoughtful um, and heartfelt discussion. Uh, next month's French Cinematheque will take place on October 23rd, and as Peter mentioned, we'll be discussing The Animal Kingdom. I just put a link to that film in the chat. Uh, we'll be sending out more information about that soon, um, and we look forward to seeing you all in October. All right, so thanks so much.